Hi, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist, and boy do I have a treat for you today. So previously on this channel, I made a video debunking Dr. Andrew Kaufman, who had a hand in popularizing the idea that SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, has never been isolated, doesn't exist, and is an exosome. Well, a friend and colleague of mine and I decided that we were going to try and engage with Dr. Kaufman on one of his webinars that he was giving. The goal here was to engage Dr. Kaufman and the person that he was co-hosting this webinar with, Dr. Thomas Cohen, who I've also made a video about, and see how they respond to questions from actual scientists. Now, we didn't really think that much was going to come of this. We thought there was a high chance of them straight up ignoring us or us not getting a chance to ask our question. But we decided to just give it a try. So we paid the $20 fee to get into the webinar, more on that later, and something beautiful happened. My friend and colleague, whose name is Thomas, actually was one of the people who got picked to ask a question during the Q&A session after the webinar. But somehow, the admins made him an admin and he was actually able to share his screen and show literal pictures of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in high resolution to doctors Andrew Kaufman and Thomas Cohen. <laughs> I can't believe they made him an admin and he got to do that. I mean, that was the best possible outcome. But anyway, here's what happened in that interaction. Yes, great. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, what I want to, uh, you know, thanks, thanks for the lecture. I really appreciate it. And as a return, I uh, actually teach a course in genomic sequencing in the fall that I welcome you both to take so we can clear up some of the issues that you might have had in terms of that black box, which is not a black box to people who know bioinformatics and sequencing. Just wanted to share with you this image here, uh, which you can see is the supposed, you know, um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, viruses and <clears throat> the coproteins. Um, these are two independent lines of evidence because they ran a Western gel which detects the protein, as you can see, correct? So this, this coprotein here, these are actually predicted in the genome itself. So how, how does that work with your model if we have basically three independent lines of evidence that the genomic sequencing is predicting the spike protein produces a specific uh, type of uh, amino acid sequence that we can visualize with this cryo-EM? and also detect on a Western blot, which detects the protein sequence. I, I think we, we would need to see the methods uh, sure. for Absolutely. evaluating this, uh, which we wouldn't have time to do now, but uh, perhaps we can follow up on. Yeah, great. Uh, here's the methods. I definitely recommend you look at it. They actually use the sucrose gradient, which you said was missing in extraction of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, in this paper. So they ran a sucrose gradient and extracted the virus uh, and then uh, had several rounds of the plate assays, um, are, are which shows the CPE damage. Are you saying they extracted yeah. the virus directly from a person? They extracted the virus. They pur purified the virus using a sucrose gradient. With no cell culture. They have used the cell culture, but why does that matter? I'm cell culture... Again, cell cultures, if you pass through multiple rounds of cell culture, the virus can reproduce. So if you take the extraction of that cell culture and replate it on another uh, plate, the virus then enters the cells, reproduces again and again and again. If, if by what you say is true that there's a toxin involved in this, then the toxin will be diluted as you go down with your cell plating cultures, right? So you go through round one, two, three, four, the toxin will dilute itself, whereas the replicating virus will keep replicating as you add in from the from the next uh, cell culture. And then, as as you can say, another line of evidence is that you extract it with a sucrose gradient, which is what they have done, aligned it with uh, the genomic sequencing, which we can clear up some of the black boxes that you have issues with. Uh, and as you can see, the visual evidence matches right what is predicted in the genomic sequence okay let's get some answers okay go ahead thank you 
Yeah, I don't I don't think Tom and I can really um, evaluate this, but I think the most important question has been answered that the sample didn't come directly from, uh, you know, a clinical sample where the virus was purified out of that. Um, but so, it did. It did originally. It did originally come from. But let's let, let's just get the answer and then we can let you respond. OK. Well, like I said, we, you know, we really would need to review the method section in order to know what we're talking about. And we'd be happy to do that and um, get a response, or at least I would, um, if you can send me the actual paper. Uh, it's the paper has been uploaded multiple times now in the comments, and we can email that to you. So let me summarize what just happened. Dr. Andrew Kaufman claims again and again in his webinars that nobody has ever purified the SARS-CoV-2 virus using a technique called sucrose gradient fractionation. It absolutely has been done, and my colleague Thomas showed him a picture of the results of that very experiment. Kaufman's response was basically, well, because they isolated it from a patient and then grew it in cell culture and then purified it, that it's no good. They had to purify it directly from a patient. This is complete nonsense to anybody who works with cell culture and viruses. Viruses need host cells in order to replicate. What is the difference of purifying a virus from a human sample, which is human cells, or purifying the virus from a cell culture? You still end up with virus. If anything, you're starting with way more contaminants from a human body than you are with a cell culture. Saying that you want to see this done without cell culture is like asking a police officer to prove that a defendant was speeding, but they're not allowed to use a radar gun. Thank you, Dr. Christine Carson, for that analogy. Later, Andrew Kaufman's sidekick, Thomas Cowan, comes back to these images and says that they're not viral particles because they were stained with heavy metals before being imaged in the electron microscope. No, this is not how cryo-electron microscopy works. He's talking about negative stain electron microscopy, a pretty old technique. Cryo-electron microscopy is a much newer technique. For cryo-electron microscopy, there is no staining involved. You just flash freeze the samples and end up with vitreous ice that you then image with an electron microscope. And what both of these guys ignore is that during this technique, you image hundreds of thousands of individual particles in order to come up with an atomic level resolution structure of what you're looking at. This means you can see the individual atoms that make up the molecules you're observing. And in this case, they can see that the spike protein has a sequence of amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, that directly match what we would expect based on the genome of the virus. So. I ask Drs. Andrew Kaufman and Thomas Cohen, what is this structure if it's not the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, and where did it come from? Unfortunately, I didn't get to ask any questions on the webinar, even though I was pretty active in the chat. But I do hope Drs. Kaufman and Cohen keep to their word and read the paper that we showed them and address it. And the invitation is totally open for them to talk about it with me and my colleague live. They can take us up on this offer, or they can continue to have their webinars in their little echo chamber where they charge $20 a pop to people who want to show up. And in this webinar, over 800 people showed up. When people ask me, why would these people lie? Well, there's a possible answer. Anyway, I just wanted to share that with you guys to show you what happens when you confront these agents of misinformation with questions from actual scientists. Hopefully you enjoyed that, and hopefully we get to do more of it in the future. But for now, if you liked it, don't forget to subscribe so you can catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. Thanks for watching. See you next time.